Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be making a start on my review of The Life and Times of the Thunderbolt Kid by Bill Bryson. So this is non-fiction, although Bryson's normally known for writing travel non-fiction, whereas this is more of a memoir of his childhood in uh, Des Moines, Iowa. I think I said Des Moines, right? And uh, yeah, as usual, I'm going to read the blurb, then I'm going to go through and check out some of my tabs, and then I'll come back with my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So, the blurb. Bill Bryson's first travel book opened with the immortal line, I come from Des Moines. Somebody had to. Didn't Slipknot come from Des Moines? In this deeply funny new book, he travels back in time to explore the ordinary kid he once was, in the curious world of 1950s America. It was a happy time, when almost everything was good for you, including DDT, cigarettes and nuclear fallout. This is a book about one boy's growing up, but in Bryson's hand, it becomes, but in Bryson's hand, it becomes everyone's story, one that will speak volumes, especially to anyone who has ever been young. And so each of the chapters have a little quote from um, like a lo local newspaper as well. So here we have chapter one, Hometown, and this is a quote from the Des Moines Tribune, uh, 6th of February 1955. Springfield, Springfield, Illinois. The State Senate of Illinois yesterday disbanded its Committee on Efficiency and Economy for reasons of efficiency and economy. And he makes a great point, this, this like, I would call it an innovation that this restaurant had back in like 1960 or whatever. And uh, they should still have this today once restaurants are back to normal. Everything about it was divine. The food, the understated decor, the motherly waitresses in their grey uniforms who carried your tray to a table for you and gladly fetched you a new fork if you didn't like the look of the one provided. Each table had a little light on it that you could switch on if you needed service, so you never had to crane round and flag down passing waitresses. You just switched on your private beacon and after a moment a waitress would come along to see what she could help you with. Isn't that a wonderful idea? Here we have a, here we have a case possibly of uh, too much information. He says, the someone else was nearly always Buddy Doberman, who lived across the alley, a secretive lane that ran in a neighbourly fashion behind our houses. Buddy was my best friend for the first portion of my life. We were extremely close. He was the only human being whose anus I have ever looked at closely, or indeed at all, just to see what one looks like. Reddish, tight, and very slightly puckered, as I recall, with a rather worrying clarity. And he was good-tempered and had wonderful toys to play with, as his parents were both generous and well-to-do. He, uh, he has some interesting character names throughout this as well. So one of them there is uh, Mrs. Bukowski, who I wonder if is a note to a nod towards Charles Bukowski. Quite probably not, to be honest. Uh, we have Dr. Alzheimer as well. Here at the start of Chapter 3, we have from the Des Moines Register, the 20th of September 1957. East Hampton, Connecticut. A search of Lake Pocktaupau for a reported drowning victim was called off here Tuesday when it was realised that one of the volunteers helping the search, Robert Hausman, 23, of East Hampton, was the person being sought. It talks about an uncle who had a hole in his throat, and it's weird because I've been watching Ideal. Uh, it's one of my old favorite TV shows, but the guy, and I can't remember his name now, but the guy who plays Walder Frey in Game of Thrones, he's in it, and his character has one of these holes in his throat and has to talk with like a modulator. So he says, I had a distant uncle named D, who, now that I think of it, may not have actually been an uncle at all, but just a strange man who showed up at all large family gatherings, who had lost his voice box and had a permanent hole in his throat as a result of some youthful injury or surgical trauma or something. Actually, I don't know why he had a hole in his throat. It was just a fact of life. A lot of rural people in Iowa in the 50s had arresting physical features. Wooden legs, stumpy arms, outstandingly dented heads, hands without fingers, mouths without tongues, sockets without eyes, scars that ran on for feet, sometimes going in one sleeve and out the other. Goodness knows what people got up to back then, but they suffered some mishaps, that's for sure. So I think this is some crazy statistics here about how quickly America's automobile industry grow rose up. When the war ended, there were only 30 million cars on America's roads, roughly the same number as it existed in the 1920s, but then things took off in a big way. Over the next four decades, as a writer for the New York Times put it, the country paved 42,798 miles of interstate highway, bought 300 million cars, and went for a ride. The number of new cars bought by Americans went from just 69,000 in 1945 to over 5 million four years later. By the mid-50s, Americans were buying 8 million new cars a year. This in a nation of approximately 40 million households. So if my maths is correctly, that's one in five, like basically, yeah, one in five households bought a new car each year. Here we have at the start of chapter seven, another one of these little interesting stories from the Des Moines Res Register. 23rd of August, 1958. Mobile, Alabama. The Alabama Supreme Court yesterday upheld a death sentence imposed on a Negro handyman, Jimmy Wilson, 55 for robbing Mrs. Estill Barker of $1.95 at her home last year. Mrs. Barker is white. Although robbery is a capital offence in Alabama, no one has been executed in the state before for a theft of less than $5. A 
A court official suggested that the jury had been influenced by the fact that Mrs Barker told the jury that Wilson had spoken to her in a disrespectful tone. A spokesman for the National Association for the Advancement of Coloured People called the death sentence a sad blot on the nation, but said the organisation is unable to aid the condemned man because it is barred in Alabama. Another crazy statistic here. By 1955, the typical American teenager had as much disposable income as the average family of four had enjoyed 15 years earlier. Some crazy stuff here about communism and the crazy overreactions. Doing anything at all to help communists became essentially illegal. In 1951, Dr. Ernest Chain, a naturalised Briton who had won a Nobel Prize six years earlier for helping to develop penicillin, was barred from entering the United States because he had recently travelled to Czechoslovakia under the auspices of the World Health Organisation to help start a penicillin plant there. Humanitarian aid was only permissible, it seems, so long as those being saved believed in free markets. Americans likewise found themselves barred from travel. Linus Pauling, who would eventually win two Nobel Prizes, was stopped at Ida Wild Airport in New York while boarding a plane to Britain, where he was to be honoured by the Royal Society, and had his passport confiscated on the grounds that he had once or that he, on the grounds that he had once or twice publicly expressed a liberal thought. Crazy. I thought this was quite interesting. This is the start of one of the chapters, chapter number ten down on the farm. Give or take the occasional ticklish murder, Iowa has always been a peaceful and refreshingly unassertive place. In the 160 years or so that it has been a state, only one shot has been officially fired in anger on Iowa soil, and even that wasn't very angry. During the Civil War, a group of Union soldiers, for reasons that I believe are now pretty well forgotten, discharged a cannonball across the state line into Missouri. It landed on a field on the other side and dribbled harmlessly to a halt. I shouldn't be surprised if the Missourians put it on a wagon and brought it back. In any case, nobody was hurt. This was not simply the high point in Iowa's military history, it was the only point in it. You described that a tornado was looking like a killer apostrophe. I think this is kind of crazy as well. Um, like literally the law fighting to get rid of diversity. He says, uh, in 1916, as the shadow of the Great War made English speaking people suspicious of loyalties, a governor of Iowa named William L. Harding decreed that henceforth it would be a crime to speak any foreign language in schools, at church, or even over the telephone in the great state of Iowa. There were howls that people would have to give up church services in their own languages, but Harding was not to be moved. There is no use in anyone wasting his time praying in other languages than English, he responded. God is listening only to the English tongue. Here we have at the start of chapter 11 another quote from one of the newspapers. Lies in morgue 17 hours, alive, Atlanta, Georgia. An elderly woman taken to a funeral home for embalming opened her eyes 17 hours after arriving and announced, I'm not dead. W.L. Murdoch of Murdoch Brothers Funeral Home has said that two of his employees were made almost speechless. The woman, listed as Julia Stalling, 70, seemed dazed after her long coma ended Sunday night, but otherwise appeared in good condition, Murdoch said. So that was from the Des Moines Tribute, 11th of May 1953. So this is possibly one of my favourite sections of the whole book, so I'm going to read the paragraph out here. He says, um, it, wasn't just that Ohio, it wasn't just that Iowa was far from everywhere. Everywhere was far from everywhere. America was especially blessed in this regard. We had big buffering oceans to left and right and no neighbours to worry us above or below, so there wasn't any need to be fearful about anything ever. Even world wars barely affected our home lives. During the Second World War, when the film mogul Jack Warner realised that from the air his Hollywood studio was indistinguishable from a nearby aircraft factory, he had a giant arrow painted on the roof above the legend Lockheed that away to steer Japanese bombers safely away from some of the valuable stars who didn't go to war, and that included Gary Cooper, Bob Hope, Fred McMurray, Frank Sinatra, John Garfield, Gene Kelly, Alan Ladd, Danny Kaye, Cary Grant, Bing Crosby, Van Johnson, Dana Andrews, Ronald Reagan and John Wayne, among many other valiant heroes who helped America to act its way to victory, and towards the correct target. This tickled me here, he's talking about some of his childhood friends. The Willoughby boys really were able to make fun out of nothing at all. On my first visit, they introduced me to the exciting sport of match fighting. In this game, the competitors arm themselves with boxes of kitchen matches, retire to the basement, turn off all the lights and spend the rest of the evening throwing lighted matches at each other in the dark. In those days, kitchen matches were heavy duty implements, more like signal flares than the weedy sticks we get today. You could strike them on any hard surface and fling them at least 15 feet and they wouldn't go out. Indeed, even when being beaten vigorously with two hands, as when lodged on the front of one sweater, they seemed positively determined not to fail. The idea, in any case, was to get matches to land on your opponents and create small, alarming bushfires on some part of their person. The hair was an especially favoured target. The drawback was that each time you launched a lighted match, you betrayed your own position to anyone skulking in the dark nearby, so that after an attack on others, you were more or less certain to discover that your own shoulder was robustly ablaze, or that the centre of your beard, or that the centre of your head was a beacon of flame fueled from a swiftly diminishing stock of hair. Here we get some uh, coverage of some of the discrimination. 
Of course, not everyone shared equally in the good times. Black people who tried to improve their lot, particularly in the Deep South, particularly in Mississippi, were often subjected to the most outrageous and shocking abuse, made, made all the more so by the fact that most people at the time didn't seem shocked or outraged at all. Clyde Kennard, a former army sergeant and paratrooper and a person of wholly good character, tried to enrol at Mississippi Southern College in Hattiesburg in 1955. He was sent away, but thought it over and came back and asked again. For this repetitive willful uppitiness, for this repetitive willful, for this repetitive willful uppitiness, university officials, I'll just make that quite clear, not students, not undereducated townspeople in white sheets, but university officials, planted illicit liquor and a bag of stolen chicken feed in his car and had him charged with grand theft. Kennard was tried and sent to prison for seven years for crimes he didn't commit. He died there before his term was completed. Elsewhere in Mississippi, at the time that Reverend George Lee and a man named Lamar Smith tried in separate incidents to exercise their right to vote, Smith actually succeeded in casting a ballot, in itself something of a miracle, but was shot dead on the courthouse steps five minutes later as he emerged with a dangerously triumphant smile. Although the killing was in broad daylight in a public place, no witnesses came forward and no assailant was ever charged. The Reverend Lee, meanwhile, was turned away at his polling station, but shot dead anyway with a shotgun from a passing car as he drove home that night. The Humphreys County Sheriff ruled the death a traffic accident. The county, co the county coroner recorded it as being of unknown causes. There were no convictions in that case either. Here he's uh, talking about his teenager years, I guess he says. News from the world of popular culture was generally discouraging as well. Research showed that cigarettes really did cause cancer, as many people had long suspected. Tarryton, my father's brand, quickly rushed out a series of ads calmly reassuring smokers that all the tars and nicotine trapped in the filter are guaranteed not to reach your throat without mentioning that all the lethal goos not trapped in the filter would. But consumers weren't so easily taken in by fatuous and misleading claims any longer, particularly after news came out that advertisers had been engaged in secret trials of devious subliminal advertising. During a test at a movie house in Fort Lee, New Jersey, patrons were shown a film in which two clip phrases, drink Coca-Cola and hungry, eat popcorn, were flashed on the screen for one three thousandth of a second every five seconds. Much too fast to be consciously noted, but subconsciously influential, or so it seemed, for sales of coke went up 57.7% and popcorn by nearly 20% during the period of the experiment, according to Life magazine. Soon, Life warned us, all movies and television programmes would be instructing us hundreds of times an hour what to eat, drink, smoke, wear and think, making consumer zombies of us all. In fact, subliminal advertising didn't work and was soon abandoned. Uh, which I'm glad that he kept that little bit in at the bottom as well, because a lot of people still believe in it for some reason. And here he talks about smoking and he uses the term French inhaling, which I've not heard before. He says, smoking was the big... Smoking was the big discovery of the age. Boy, did I love smoking, and boy did it love me. For a dozen or so years I did little in life but sit at desks, hunched over books, French inhaling, which is to say drawing ropes of smoke up into the nostrils from the mouth, which gives a double hit of nicotine with every heavy installation, as well as projecting an air of cerebral savoir faire, even at the cost of having a nicotine stained upper lip and permanent yellowy brown circlets about the nostrils or lounge back with hands behind head blowing languorous smoke rings, at which I grew so proficient that I could bounce them off pictures on distant walls, or fire one smoke ring through another. Skills that marked me out as a grand master of smoking before I was quite 15. He got in trouble because um, his careers counsellor said, it doesn't appear that you are qualified to do much of anything. And he says, I guess I'll have to be a high school careers counsellor then. And uh, then he had to write a letter of apology, and it became even more important because that decided whether he'd stay on at school or not. And if he didn't stay on at school, he would have got drafted. I've got a WhatsApp message. All right, and then just one final local news story I want to share here. This is at the start of chapter 14, Farewell. In Milwaukee, uninjured when his auto swerved off the highway, Eugene Cromwell stepped out to survey the damage and fell into a 50-foot limestone quarry. He suffered a broken arm. And that's from Time Magazine, 23rd of April, 1956. So yeah, overall, I did enjoy reading this. I didn't think it was as fun as his travel writing, but there was some still still some pretty good stuff in it. Overall, I'd give it like a pretty solid 3.75, 4 out of 5. I think if you're American or, or of a certain age, I think you'd enjoy this a lot more. But um, I do still quite like 50s American stuff, mainly because of the music, you know, so there was some stuff in there for me. So there we have it, that's what I made of The Life and Times of the Thunderbolt Kid by Bill Bryson. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read this book and if so, what you thought of it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video, hit subscribe for more, and I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.